Good morning, Mike Gardner. How are you? I am excellent, Mark. Thank you for having me here today. It's yeah, it's very cool. You've got a you've got a real good story. It's it's also really cool um, having people in the entrepreneurs hot seat who aren't first time entrepreneurs who have already taken companies to a successful exit, which you've done twice. And uh, I want to talk about the companies. Well, we first met when when you were running Agreement Express, very cool company, and. Um, and I, some of the stats around Agreement Express were staggering. The whole Agreement Express, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just blurb. The whole idea, Agreement Express was about getting uh, verified, certified signatures on documents and uh, being able to share documents around where you can have simultaneous signatures and then being able to store them. And some of the stats that, that I heard working on your business about the amount of paper that's generated in a real estate deal when you have the realtor, the banker and the client, and then they all have to sign stuff and then share it amongst each other. And then when it gets stored, it has to get stored for seven years and the amount of real estate and heating that's taken, heating paper up for seven years. I, I just, I, I, I couldn't believe it. I thought it was, I thought it was one of the, one of the coolest businesses. Uh, tell, tell me, tell me a little bit about that. Tell me about your, your journey in, into, into like being a guy who gets called into, you know, make companies work well and, and so that was a fascinating journey right because uh you know um when when we sort of you know, that is now kind of sort of classes the digital signature space uh, mm -hmm. but when uh when we pivoted what was then called for combo uh, we had to rebrand it because the, the name didn't mean anything um mm -hmm. so uh when we first pivoted into that there was like literally nobody in that space there was two other companies you know, uh, you know, DocuSign was a fledgling company in, in Seattle that really didn't have anything. Like, I swear, there was a period of time that between us and another firm in, in Quebec that were, uh, that were also putting out, um, you know, digital documents for execution, there was a time that uh, when either one of us would make a, uh, an update to our website, you would see it reflected on the other company's web website within 24 hours, because we were all searching <laughs> for messaging that actually worked, which is yeah. part of the reason why uh, yeah. Why I called it you? I'm like, hey, this is getting crazy. We can't even figure out how this goes. What was interesting in that particular venture, Mark, was that um, once we actually figured out, okay, this is the space, um, then uh, DocuSign had managed to raise a whole pile of cash. Like, I mean, a bunch of cash, and we were like, okay, well, we're going to get clobbered because this is going to be what's the standard. Mm -hmm. So we uh, we pivoted that and we shifted to say we're not going to just focus on the document. We're going to focus on, on data, data heavy documents. So that moved us into uh, wealth management and why that was really important was because you're collecting data at a massive volume mm -hmm. and that data wants to be reused because you, know, you, you'll do multiple transactions with your advisor. Uh, mm -hmm. You'll open up multiple accounts and why re-enter that data. So it's sort of like, and it also, I mean, what was so cool. Modified. What was so cool about that model was that, you know, if you, everybody knows from a consumer point of view, if I get called to a website and I have to fill in the same blanks again and again, and it, it pisses me off. It's really a fundamental, simple human thing. And the nice thing is, is the way you were working was every time I come in and do something with your wealth management company, you ask me for a few more details. So not only is my profile more complete, but you're gathering all this information on me, which was awesome well and so what that took us to is that and you're spot on like the, so it was like wealth management insurance and payments right those mm -hmm. were three areas that that took a massive amount of, of data and what that shifted the problem space to being was it moved the problem out of how fast can i get something signed mm -hmm. to um how much can i reduce what, what was called the nigo rate or the not in good order rate um you know because sick because if you're filling in uh like 1500 data points, which is the average number on like a life insurance policy, but like 1500 pieces of data that no you would way. be filling in. Yeah, 1500. Um, and a lot of that's repetitive, right? Like you're writing uh -huh. your same number over and over again. But if you're, if you make, if there's a discrepancy, like if you're doing that with a pen and there's a discrepancy between two points, they have to call. So like somebody has to A, check that. And then somebody B has to call to say, well, I can't guess that the first time you wrote it, you were paying attention and the second time you weren't. Um, so which one, which one is right? They have to actually, they actually have to check. 
Um, and if you think of a life insurance application, you know, the, the making a mistake of, you know, my pre-existing condition is I have cancer or I don't have cancer. This is a very important, uh, this is a very important question to ask, right? Yeah. Um, so, so not in good order rates in that industry, uh, in those industries ranged from uh, 40% to 80%. And so that shifted our problem space from we're trying to get stuff done faster, which is what Docu could do because they had all the capital behind it, to we're trying to reduce the not in good order rate which was not important to everybody, like classic marketing mm-hmm. 101. Don't, don't try to be something to everybody. Yeah. Pick a group that this is Part really of a tight niche. To. And if, uh, you know, and if reducing your not in good order rate was really important to wealth management firms, insurance companies, and payment companies, then that's where you put your attention. And so that's mm-hmm. where we went. And that's, that's how we carved out a niche in what was not necessarily a crowded market, Mark, but one that there was an 800 pound gorilla that had emerged. And we we're like, okay, well, there's, one, there's only one way you don't get clobbered. And mm-hmm. that's, that's create a segment that would be frankly, really hard. Even to this day, they don't go, they don't go after that too, uh, because it's just too hard. Like it's a very complicated piece. Now there, there is a super good learning in here. I mean, we want to address a challenge that you have. That's the whole reason for entrepreneurs hot seat. But I mean, you have got such a wealth of knowledge for the group here at brand DIY. Um, the whole idea of, of uh, creating a product and carving out an ever and ever and ever tighter niche is on the surface so counterintuitive and i think everybody gives it lip service now because they it's trendy to talk about that but i don't think people really investigate how to go about doing that how did you do that well you know and this is uh apart from getting beaten about the head and shoulders exactly well you know part of it is the the uh you know every time uh you know i've been quoted on this a few few times that every time i would narrow the focus of the business we would grow more and I would think that's as narrow as you could get. And it's a little bit like uh, uh, like deconstructive art, right? You know, yeah. where, where, you, where you're like, okay, this is perfect. And then, and then like a really epic artist says, why don't we take some elements away? And you're like, no, what do you mean? Right? And, yeah. and you keep subtracting elements until it, it, doesn't, it doesn't have the essence anymore. Um, and, and so it's a, in, in like music, because you and I are both musicians, mm-hmm. right? Uh, you know, the more space you leave, the better, the better it gets, right? So. Mm-hmm. So for how I would always approach it is the, okay, well, we, have we identified the need and, um, and then can we consistently message that? And if we start taking away elements, do we still have the value? Because the more simple we, we can distill it down to, the better we're gonna have in being able to communicate it, right? So if you think about it, we went from the very complicated messaging that you and I were working on with Agreement Express uh, to um, we're trying to reduce your not in good order rate uh, from you know 30, 40, 60 percent down to less than two percent. If I reduced your not in good order rate to less than two percent, would that be a value to you? Right? Yeah, you know I can, but That's, you can imagine it's it's such it's like the bow of a ship or a north star. It it becomes so clear and so defined that you go, well, are we going to buy this accounting program or are we going to buy those beanbag chairs? And it, it suddenly everything becomes real clear. If it helps in this really specific thing, you do it. If it doesn't, forget it. If you got a fuzzy goal or a wide goal, it's so easy to squander resources, hire the wrong people, make bad decisions, you know? Well, and then if you think, you know, the, you end up selling yourself into bad deals, right? And it's, a, and the discipline it takes, right? One of the hardest things is you have sales teams that are out there that are like, oh, but I could get this deal if we just, and then it's like, an, it's additive, mm-hmm. right? And it's like, rather than saying, okay, well, maybe not everybody is a perfect target for me. And I have but to take- But that's hard if you're facing quotas, right? If you're facing quotas and, you know, on the other side is the entrepreneur, right? If you're facing payroll, right? And mm-hmm. you're and you're like, okay, well, we really, really desperately need the deal. And it's having that discipline um, to say, not all revenue is good revenue, yeah. right? Uh, you know, it's practice. that's something I, I would throw it open to the, the brand DIYers if they want to reach out to you because you are a member. Because I know there are a lot of people facing this right now. They see something, they're not making money. They go, let's do all this stuff. And when you hear it, you go, that's dumb. But you appreciate that they're hurting and they're scared and uh, they're only going to do themselves more harm, uh, but they don't know what else to do, you know? Well, and the kick in the pants, of course, is that sometimes you do actually have to pivot, right? Yeah. That's like more often than not, right? You, it, you haven't quite got it, but once you find the vein, then you have to kind of commit to it, right? Yeah. And it's that, and it's that, okay, because, you know, uh, you know, if the if the board of directors from uh, from Agreement Express was here, they'd say, "No, no, Mike was the king of the pivot. We had to we had to adjust, 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 adjust." And while we're trying to find the course, 
Um, but then once we found the course, then, okay, now you got to drive hard into it. So finding yeah. that it's the, it's that when to quit, um, aspect of the, when do you quit, uh, an idea to say, okay, that, yeah. that isn't quite it. Right. Yeah. And how much cash do you burn up in the process of getting to that? Oh, point? Jesus. Now, I, speaking of pivots, I'm going to pivot because, um, you went from selling SaaS software as a service to making widgets <laughs> and that doesn't happen. Yeah. Uh, so what, the, you know, yeah. Yeah. Hard, how, how come hard, hard shift, hard shift. So, um, you know, uh, when, when I got, uh, when I wrapped up with agreement express, that was the second software company that I'd sold. So I had 25 years of software. And in fact, my first software company made the transition from on-prem to, uh, to SaaS before we even called it SaaS. We were going mm -hmm. application service providers, right? We were, mm -hmm. um, so we were already making that shift and, and, you know, and from a consumer perspective, as a buyer, SaaS is wicked. It's awesome. From an investor I, I love I oh. love SaaS I, because yeah, constant improvements don't have to think about it. Thirteen dollars a month is that a lot of money? I don't know. Totally, uh, and and you know, and, and always this continuous evolution of the product, so it's continuously getting better. I always describe SaaS as um, uh, on prem is like being a distant uncle of that. And every once in a while, a new release shows up, and you're like, "Who's this kid?" It's like yeah. it's like you just saw your your ne your nephew like like a year later, and you're like, "Who are you? You're totally you're totally different. I have to relearn you. This is crazy." Where, uh, where SaaS is like living with your kids. You're like, you're like, they've been evolving. And then after a year, you're like, oh my goodness, I can't even believe you're the same. Like, this is amazing. Like mm -hmm. how much you've changed, but you've yeah. been a part of it, right? So, so as a user, it's fantastic. As an investor, it's amazing. The multiples are incredible on SaaS. As an entrepreneur though, I was watching this happen and it's a, it's a disaster for the entrepreneur because it's so cash intensive. You know, bankers have said right from the beginning, SaaS is so capital intensive upfront mm -hmm. because getting to the point where your monthly recurring revenue, where your MRR exceeds your monthly burn rate is like, it, that's not a short journey. Like, yeah, mm -hmm. it will be the occasional person that throws the perfect dart and they hit it bullseye right on and you get there, but that's rare, right? And if you, so what happened is when I sold the last software company, I was like, okay, do I go off and help the next firm or start one of these again, raise a pile of capital and then potentially be down to, you know, you know, single digit ownership as a, uh, as the entrepreneur, or do I adjust, do I pivot myself and, uh, and move to something else where there is actually economics of scale. So, mm -hmm. so I, to, to do that, I started looking at, well, well, why, why do companies fail? Why do they need so much cash? And, and we've all seen the stat, you know, nine out of 10 companies, 90% of companies are going to, are going to fail in their first, in their first five years. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but I started digging into the 90. I didn't want to understand the 10. I wanted to understand the 90. Yeah. I was just going to touch on that. We, we had that conversation and I think that is something that way too few of us do. We always look at competitors or models and we always look at the ones who nailed it and we learn from them because damn it, it makes a good book. And we don't look at all the, the bozos just like us who are like, oh crap, 90% of us don't nail yeah, it. Exactly. So I wanted to understand that, right? Because, you know, the chances are it's, uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, as, as they say with the, with the astronauts, right? They're like, they're like, no, 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 you, you practice the stuff that's gonna, that's gonna kill you. You don't, you don't, you don't, you don't go, we, we don't practice doing things successfully and over and over again. We practice failing a pile of times so that we can yeah. get good at dealing with that. So I wanted to understand the 90% because you know, odds are I'm not going to just fall into the 10. That hubris would be a dangerous way to approach. Yeah. So I looked at it and said, okay, well, what's going on? And so the, the stats are it's 42, 43%, depending on, on which, which uh, numbers you look at, uh, of ventures fail uh, because there is no addressable market need for what they've okay, created. Okay, let's, let's unpack that for folks who don't understand what addressable market need is. That is real simple English for... Folks don't want the solution because there is no problem or the problem is a, a different problem, but they, they don't want what you've got. And I'm like, oh my God, that takes it right back to brand. The yep. first thing you do with a brand is you ask folks, what do they think of this company or this space? And nobody does that. Yes. Yeah. And if you, and if you look at my, like my whole career in software is actually taking over other people's ideas. 
Mm-hmm. And, and a lot of times it was just being the guy that says, I don't think there's actually a market here. I got just, just to be clear. Um, I, I don't, I don't think what we're, what, how we are solving that problem might exist. Right. Mm-hmm. So a lot of times people do, they do identify the problem, but your solution, you know, I always look at that solutions fall into uh, three categories and they're not discrete. You can, you can have a combination of all three. Uh, you can, you can save money with it. Uh, you can improve the outcome. Um, or you can make it more convenient. And I always tell people, convenience wins over all of those. Um, you know, convenience is why we will buy suspect milk from a dairy we've never heard of before at twice the price from the place in the basement of my condo um, when it's pouring rain or sleet and the, and the grocery store is six blocks away. That's what, I'll, I'll do that for convenience. Yeah. And, it, and it doesn't matter. You could have organic, incredible stuff six blocks away. I'm not going there, right? So most of the time, I find that people have missed the utility of convenience, and they think that you're going to be able to get over it with just being better or just being cheaper. And, and it's not, right? That, that doesn't get you there. So that's that super, that's super profound. You know, I think that that is the first time that I've ever heard it put like that, because it's always a and 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 it's not like okay convenience wins hands down but that's something you that's something you experienced right well and and we, we've all been and so that's when i would look at stuff i would go okay and i even would look at that in software adoption because you bring some amazing products out there and if you think that's per, sort of a perverse logic right because the the finance department is often the final say on, on the purchase for an enterprise mm-hmm. uh, when, when you're going to buy enterprise software and of course what do they look at well how much money am i going to save Mm-hmm. Right. And then so they so they buy it because they realize how much money they're going to save. And that's where you get that. You know, the, the classic, the hype cycle of adoption that Gartner, not Gartner, but Gartner puts out. No, um, I don't even know that. Oh, oh, so the hype cycle of adoption is this, this funky curve. And they and they gave it all funny names. Like you have the uh, the peak of, of over heightened expectations and then you fall into the trough of disillusionment and then you rise out into into this sort of slow adoption of mainstream. Oh man, I got to write that down. It's the, yeah. it's the, it's like the Gartner, Gartner report. Gartner, Gartner, yeah, the Gartner yeah. people with the T. The hype uh, cycle. The hype cycle of adoption. And, uh, and I think that is absolutely true. When you buy technology based on how much money it's going to save, not how much utility it's going to bring from a convenience perspective for users. Uh, and, and the classic example, and I apologize to the people at SAP, but the classic <laughs> example is that the finance department buys SAP because it's because this is what they need. It's better and it's going to somehow be cheaper, right? That yeah. that's better and cheaper than what they're doing. Gets them out of spreadsheets, does all this other stuff. But yeah. it's a w- ridiculous inconvenience for the rest of the organization. So that but the finance department sells it to everybody. Wait till we're on SAP, everything's going to be better. It's going to be amazing. Be, and so you get that oh, peak of overheightened expectations, and then people get out there and they're like, I can't enter my expense report. How come I can't yeah. get my reports? With Boom, into the trough of disillusionment, right? But rather than it just dying right there because they spent so much money on it because it wasn't cheap, they spent so much money on it. CEO and the CFO send out an email to everybody saying, if you want to get paid, you, you want your expenses, it. you better start using it. And then you get the slow adoption back up as they resolve the issues. But now, that pissed. hype cycle does not, did not happen for the iPhone. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, that didn't, it was like that, man. It's yeah. like, in fact, it went and like, then curved up even more. And that's because the convenience of putting all of that stuff into your phone is yeah. so high, right? It's so, so obvious in hindsight, right? To- totally, but so I would, I would always look at it when I would go into a project, I'd go, how come the same piece of software can be incredibly successful in this client and fail in this one? And it's that convenience aspect, right? It's the uh-huh. convenience is what it always came down to. So for me, pivoting was always around convenience, but. Hilarious. All right, now let's get to widgets. Okay. I want to I want to talk about your your business and 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 the challenge. So all right. So after understanding that I, I didn't want to I didn't want to go back to the software. I'm like okay. Well, well, 25 years ago you would have never thought of it hard goods. Because um, mm. uh, the same convenience issues. Like if you think that the the phone the iPhone is is that a device or is it a piece of software? Right. Eh, kind of on the line. Right. Mm-hmm. So but we would have never touched that 25 years ago because. Mm-mm. Uh, prototyping was ridiculously expensive, like crazy expensive. Uh, the, uh, the cost of manufacturing um, was really high because your economic order quantities. Getting it on the bloody shelf. Oh, yeah, well, and, and, and I got to have, have like a warehouse full of them, right? Uh-huh. Um, and then distribution, to your point yeah. of the distribution was like, was held down by, by the buyers, right? There was mm-hmm. no, 
the buyers uh, that were purchasing on behalf of the major retailers. And if you didn't, and you had to buy your shelf space in that world that you knew so well, right? That, oh my God. And, and the only people who could do it was Procter and Gamble and Unilever, because I mean, it cost you a million dollars to get the bottle for a new detergent done. Who can do that? Nobody except Procter and Unilever, you know? Right. And then, and then, and then I have no idea what you were paying for shelf space to be at eye level. Uh, to it avoid was like the mafia. It was the mafia. To avoid being either on the ground so that the, the yeah. two-year-olds are seeing it or up so high you needed a ladder, right? Yeah. Right. So, so, but that to me has changed, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, you know, the, the world of, you know, uh, like I can 3D design on my iPad, right? Um, with, with really inexpensive SaaS software. So I, God help the poor guys on the economics behind that, that, that application. Uh, but, you know, I can 3D design on that. Uh, you know, I can 3D print a prototype just to try it out. Uh, I can work my way through what I think are the adjustments that need to be made before I hand it to, you know, proper, you know, mechanical and, mm -hmm. and electromechanical engineers mm -hmm. to, to take now a working prototype and turn that into a product. So the mm -hmm. concept was, look, if I can prototype, you know, take the same ideas I have, right? And in, in frankly, no different to, to the literature, um, you know, you're not going to, you're not going to write a unique story. You're going to take a you're going to take a theme and you're going to improve on it, but use the mm -hmm. same concepts of convenience. Can I make something better? Mm -hmm. And then I thought, okay, well, if I could do that inexpensively to get products out there and then, Hey, well, if nine out of 10 of these aren't going to, are going to need to pivot, mm -hmm. well, then the secrets to run 10, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So if don't do one, don't do a bunch of them. And some of them, the, the pivot will be obvious. Oh, I needed to make that blue instead of green. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I needed to make that, you know, you know, a little bit better over here and a little bit and, and others are going to be like, okay, that's just a bad idea. I thought mm -hmm. I had a great idea, but it's just a terrible concept. Mm -hmm. Toss it away. So I began incubating products, hard goods. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I have a little, I have a little prototype in my hand here. This that's is excellent. Just, that's a straw. That's a silly that, straw. That looks like a straw. It looks like a straw. This is actually a, uh, this is actually a clip uh, for holding up uh, holiday lights or other things like that. Uh, to eave trough that is uh, installable using this little attachment that goes on a pole. So you don't have to, so you don't have to go, you don't have to get up on your ladder. I have those things. I have the ones you have to clip by hand. And they break. And, and, and you got to climb break. up on the ladder. They, they, yeah. And, and they're, they break at an insane rate. And once you get the good ones that clip on, you can't get them off. Can't get them and off. then you break them because they've been through the cold weather. Oh my God, you're doing that. Yes, yes. So this, 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 uh, and this one is actually, this is funny. I'm, I'm short of springs. So my engineer has all the good springs. So I've got the crappy spring here. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's actually spring loaded, goes into this little pole attachment. You buy the little poles that go up for like, like you'd use for changing. Yeah, window washers and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and so you just go in and you can pop it up there and you can hook it on. And then um, it's really easy to do. And then you can go and take this and take it off again. And mm -hmm. at worst, if it's a really tall house, you might be on a step ladder. Right. But you're not. You know, you're not climbing up on your roof in, oh, uh, so smart. in in November or December when it's wet and snowy and whatever. Yeah. yeah. So and what are so, the challenges? What are the challenges, if any? Okay. So, so of course, uh, you know, this is the world now of each one of these. So you think I've got like 10 different products under development of all different types. They're uh -huh. not all like funky little clips. Yeah. Um, so the challenge, of course, is, well, how on earth are you going to brand each one of these? Because these are all unique. Right. Uh -huh. And yeah. so this is where I was Completely talking. Completely different company. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. And it's, uh, you know, so the, my own firm is just basically a, an incubator old co. Mm -hmm. And each one of these is its own. And I was like, I think I said, I think I created KTEL again. Yeah. I think, uh, yeah. Totally. <laughs> it's basically the Pocket it, Fisherman. It's Ron Popeil. Exactly. Exactly. So now I'm out there going, oh my goodness, I got all these, these crazy things that are coming out. And some of these, are like, we'll put them out there and we'll just see what the market does. Some of them will actually test demand through, um, uh, through pre order. Uh, yeah. stuff like that. You won't pre-order a bag of clips, right? I'll send you a bag of clips and we'll see what happens. Right. Kind of. Yeah. I, I think that's a brilliant idea. I mean, you, you talked to me in September or October that there's a, there's a clip innovation and you put a little infomercial out there on, on Facebook or wherever, and you can go, you can pre-buy now group buy, you know, the more people we get to group buy, the cheaper the bag is for you. I think that's genius. And it, it can be as simple as the handy dandy, and it just comes in a, in a Ziploc baggie. I mean, the, you don't need to have packaging if you're doing group buys. Well, that's, and that's, you know, and, and the, the, 
you know, reality is you're going to toss it the bulk of the packaging that comes to you anyway, right? <laughs> the, uh, mm -hmm. um, you know, you might, you might want something that's like a more durable bag so because you can reuse them, right? So you, you, the, uh, you might want a more durable bag so you can toss them back in there for next season. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, it was funny as we were, as we were, uh, as Ryan and I, Ryan's my, uh, my chief engineer that works with me on this. Um, as Ryan and I were working on this, we're like, you know, um, we, we originally designed this for Eve trough, but, um, and for holding up holiday lights, but, but like, you know, if you wanted to like hang up a sign that said, you know, happy birthday, Martin, um, it, it holds a massive amount of weight. You can just use the same clip and put it across ah, the, I think, the just I think married, yeah. the just married sign, the whatever it might be. Yeah. And then, and then we pointed out, well, you know, if you've got one of those glass, um, railings, uh, like which, you know, in the West coast, we have tons of. Yeah. Uh, these slide nicely over top of that and clip down, or even frankly in tree branches, if you if you're one of those people that wants to hook yeah. around. So we started coming up with other uses for it, which is kind of fun, right? Um, well, all you have to do is because you know we're so used to in our head the one application, but if you demonstrate that there's different applications because it's made better, suddenly people get ideas. All the all the dads get ideas. Totally, and that's and we're like we're as we're putting these things, we're getting these things ready to to get out there to the market. What we're hoping for is that that sort of you know, show me the creative ways you've used this, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because there's going to be creative ways that we haven't even thought of. Uh, but the idea is that, you know, there's not a massive expense that went into the, uh, into the R&D. Now, largely that's because a bunch of it was my own sweat equity, right? That, that mm -hmm. went into that. Mm -hmm. but, if, but, but again, we haven't had to go off and raise massive amounts of capital. I was able to self-fund it. My company also has an advisory side that helps to fund Mm -hmm. um, and fun that because of course I know my way around the software business. So lots of software mm -hmm. people call me and say, Hey, can you help me with my software business? I'm like, sure, because you're going to help me with my product business by providing me needed capital <laughs> that, that stops me from going out there, having to figure out a evaluation yeah. and raise yeah. money around it. Yeah. So and but that, for me, yeah. it's like, it's a challenge of like, okay, now, like, do I, do I create a, do I create a theme for the names of these things for the, for the branding of these things? Do I, do I not worry about that? And they're just, they all stand alone and, you just sit down with a whiteboard and start coming up with, uh, uh, you know, somebody when they were looking at the clip, they were like, "Hey, it kind of looks like a like a kind of a freaky little disco dancer." They're like, "Hey, mm -hmm. dude, depending on how you look at it." They're like, you "Come up." Well, with some you know, name. I, I think uh, just based on personal experience, you got so you've got the the Procter and Gamble model where every product is is marketed independently, and the strength of that is if one product tanks, then it doesn't reflect badly on the whole company, at least superficially. You've yep. got the craft model which is craft slices, craft cheese whiz, craft peanut butter. So everything comes back to the mothership, which has the strength of, it's a seal of approval that I know, or Johnson and Johnson, uh, that it's a family company and everything there is good for my family. However, you know, you put some, you put some stuff that gives you a rash in the baby oil and suddenly the entire company takes a hit. Then you've got the Unilever model, which is every product has its own identity, but there's a fairly strong Unilever banner you see the banners in every single commercial um i think that the unilever model just because i mean i know unilever worked with proctor and unilever and craft um i think the unilever model is the best because if right from the start you brand yourself as the better ideas people uh you know and your focus is we take existing stuff widgets and ooch them up so that they that they're better and we talked to a million dads and we found out they hate this flipping thing that they have to hang. The good ones will break when you take them off. The bad ones will break when you put them on and you're on the roof. So you can't get more or it's hard. Yep. And so we took that thing, the dad problem and we fixed it brought to you by the better ideas. And it's called the, the hanger boy or whatever. And, and so it's got its own identity Mm -hmm. but it's got a seal of approval which boosts your trust and and it won't happen on the first try but it'll happen on the second and third and fourth another great idea brought to you by the good idea guys you know looking around the world saving the world one better idea at a time you know and, and suddenly so you've got a persona you become the myth busters of of shit products and um so you go we found a shit product we found a product does an important thing shitty you get to focus, you get to laser focus on that. And when you launch it and people go, you know what, they really did fix it. Suddenly you start to build cache. If a product fails, we're idea guys, you know, nine out of 10 of them will need tweaks and stuff like that. But we're, we're in the idea business, you know, yeah. I, I, like I think that's a very strong, I think that's a very strong way to do it.
So and it's super easy to market too, right? Well, and so that that opens up a really interesting question. So when you uh, you know, and I'm you know, I'm a brand DIYer, and so I've got my little uh, my 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 brief. Uh, that so then, would you write two briefs, Mark? Is that how you do? It? You would you would write you'd be writing a brief about um, you know about the idea guys, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then you're writing and and then you start writing sub briefs, mm -hmm. so to speak. Is that how super that works? Super easy, super easy. It's um, uh, in, in the brief, uh, you, you create, first of all, we create an overarching brief. We say, who are we? And, um, and we are the idea guys. And so that's, that's a brand and the, everything that comes from here answers to our, our values, our mission, our vision, whatever you want to call it is we take existing things that are a great idea, but aren't quite there. And we take them up. That's what we do. And we specialize in right now, we specialize in dad stuff, but we can, or we could say we specialize in household stuff or we specialize yep. in shitty things for the office it is shit stuff that should be better yep. in the office. You can, you can get real tight. That's your specialty. So you create that. And then that becomes that Unilever thing in the background. So it, you do a website about that. Uh, you know, where you're talking about the, the, the mythology, the story, the why we did this and the problem we saw. And then you write briefs, just like we'd write a brief for McDonald's where we go, it's the new bacon cheeseburger, bacon cheeseburger, bacon cheeseburger, bacon cheeseburger from McDonald's, got you it. know, and you go, oh, it's from McDonald's. I know it's going to taste like what McDonald's tastes like. Um, so, you know, that, 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 boxes it in, in my brain, knowing it comes from McDonald's, that there's a seal of approval, that it's going to taste not too crazy, that my kids will eat it um, because it's from McDonald's. If it comes from the better idea guys, I know that it's going to be robust, that it's going to be well thought through and that it's going to, that it's going to last a long time and the customer service is going to be awesome. So those are, I just pulled those yep. out of my ass. Right. Um, but it's easy building that stuff in. And then product launch by product launch, you build equity in the company until the next launch becomes one of those things where they go, oh, I can't wait. What are you going to do next? Well, we're doing a, a survey. We're trying to find a thousand items that need fixing and whittle that down to one a year. And that's what we're going to do, you know? Um, nice. And so, but the, the brief yeah. then can become, you know, find us the items. And then the next brief can be, turns out it is funnels. Funnels suck. Yeah. And, and so then you come up with a brief for the funnel for making the funnel. Then you come up with a brief for, for marketing the funnel. But I would suggest that, you know, with just demonstrating the, the improvement that you've made uh, at the very beginning, it could be a fairly easy marketing job. And then if you finish it off on brought to you by the better idea guys, suddenly it sounds like there's something to it. it sounds like they're like, this isn't your first kick at the can. You know, so the brief for the actual product starts to get oomph and, and you start to get legitimacy and trust that no brand new product should have. So um, two briefs, the idea guys, and yeah. then every individual product becomes a launch like a bacon cheeseburger, yeah. but it's always brought to you by McDonald's. You know, right. uh, I, think, I think that's a super winning formula and I can't wait to see those, uh, the light hangers, man. I need, I need some advanced orders. I'll definitely group by those. There you go. Well, well, it's funny, you know, as, as, I, as I mentioned before, like I am, I'm knee deep in you know, conscious incompetence, right? The, uh, uh, the, you know, being so used to building up, you know, you know, a big group of people all united behind one thing as a company is what I've done. I know how to run a business, but, you know, switching all of a sudden to building, you know, actual physical things, um, was such a, uh, a mind shift. Uh, and it's funny because a lot of the advisors that I've spoken with are all like, you know, normally we, we come into it, vendors that don't know how to run businesses. They know how to invent, but they don't know how to, they don't know how to run a business. We, we've rarely run into people that know how to run a business, but are trying to figure out the invention side of well, it. But you and I talked about this. The, the, uh, it is becoming, uh, coming up with ideas is hard, always has been, but I think it's a lot harder now because like you said, uh, a lot of us invent solutions to problems that don't exist. <laughs> uh, so it's hard to come up with a, 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 pro a solution that really has a strong problem. Those light things have a strong problem. Um, so you're on a great track. Uh, 
creating this stuff, the hard, that used to be the hard part. Like I said, million dollars to get a bottle made. Now you can go anywhere. You say, hey, I need, I need these things made, lowest bid. And there's people lining up thanks to the interweb who can make this stuff, you know? So it's, uh, you, if, you, if you know how to run a company, the invention stuff is a lot easier than it used to be because there's yeah, so I, many people it, who are just freelancing that. Well, and, and you know, I think you nailed the point too of the, like, where does it start? And a lot of it is me just, um, you know, part of this was taking some time off after selling Agreement Express. Part of this was a pandemic, right? Uh, where suddenly you're out there and you're doing things and just being consciously aware of this is really inconvenient. Like this is an actual problem because I have it right now. And, and I like literally the light clip came up last year when I'm like, I am not climbing on that roof. I'm like, I'm like, no, like uh, there's no way at my age I'm getting up on. This is how this is how middle age how people die. die. This, yeah. is exactly, this, this is how you end up in a hospital with a broken hip. Right. Yeah. Or you die. Right. This is like, yeah. That's just dumb. And I'm, and I'm looking across and, you know, how did my neighbor solve the problem? Well, they hired a company to come in and put up their lights. And I'm like, I'm not going to hire somebody to come in and put up my lights. And then, and then of course, like seconds later, I had to change the light bulb. And I'm like, well, I don't own a 30 foot step ladder. I have uh -huh. a pole with a little suction yeah. cup on it that helps me take down the lights. I'm like, how come I can't put up lights outside with one of these things, but I can take down light bulbs with one of these things in the house. I'm like, okay, go, go build me one of them. That's Richard Branson, man. That's how he started Virgin Air. It was the same thing. He was just pissed off because he couldn't get off an island because the airline decided not to. So he rented himself an airplane and took everybody with him. He went, wait a minute, yeah. I can do this? You know, and suddenly he just connected chocolate and peanut butter and, and off you go. Oh, it's brilliant. I can't wait. Uh -huh. I can't wait. I want, I want to work with you on this stuff. This is going to be uh, super I'm, fun. I'm, ex I'm excited by it, Mark. And of course, you know, the challenge, of course, is as soon as you come up with a great idea like that, you're like, oh, crap. Unfortunately, I don't know anything about 3D design. I don't know anything about manufacturing. Um, you know, and I don't, I don't know anything. I, I, I know software patents, but I don't know hardware patents. And you're like, okay, um, what do you do? So I'm like, okay, well, let's just break down one problem at a time. Yeah. And keep chipping, up, chipping away at them. And, uh, and then I'm like, okay, well, the company's going to need capital. Well, all right. Advisory side of the business. Here yeah. we go. And so that all began. You're only, you're only ever, it's not like it used to be when we used to have to go to the library, pull a book out. You know, you're only two clicks from an expert now. Totally. You know, there's and, a patent, there's a patent guy people, waiting like out even, there. Even this channel alone, like lots of people that are like, oh, by the way, I've solved that problem before. Can I yeah. tell you how I did it? Let me tell you how not to do it. Yeah, exactly. Which is just, which frankly, is even more valuable than this yeah. is how you should do it. Yeah. Right? I'm, yeah. A yeah. I'm a fountain of, here's not how not to do it. I'm a fountain <laughs> of that knowledge, man. Yeah, I, anyways, uh, unfortunately, so am I. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, but I mean, that's the fun of it. That's the. I mean, I think that marks the entrepreneur the failure and endless enthusiasm. I think those well, are the two hallmarks. Yeah. Well, a chief enthusiasm officer, right? Is the uh, yeah. Uh, is totally. that a chief eternal optimist? But yeah. Uh, the uh, but the, the the key, of course, to me is making sure that you know, uh, being able to, as I have done with the companies that I've gone into in the past, being able to critically look at a product and say, right now we have a ton of enthusiasm over a tiny little light clip. Um, it might be too narrow. It might be too springy. It might be too something. And we just have to make a minor adjustment and a tweak and then we can make it better. Cool. It might be a terrible idea in practice. It was a great idea on paper. It was a terrible idea in practice. The goal of this company is to make sure that we didn't blow 60, $80 million coming to that conclusion Mm -hmm. Right, which is what which is what Silicon Valley software startups are looking at for like, you know, by the time they're done their seed, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 million dollars. And like what's left for the yeah, for the entrepreneur. Like it's how down much to, money do you have to make to pay back? Oh my god, totally. yeah. Well, and if you think, you know, like a, a five bagger um uh -huh. is is a is a is a good day and a ten bagger is sort of an expectation out of some of these well, you're 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 in half to to three quarter unicorn land mm -hmm. every time you start a, a software company and how ridiculously there, there's a reason why they're called unicorns yeah yeah you know, like, they don't exist <laughs> yeah. exactly they don't they, they don't they're not every day man this yeah. is this this is not another harry potter book where they're just <laughs> going to show up in the next chapter right they, exactly they, they just don't happen so that the bar is too high so a lot of my goals hey bring the bar down 
and we'll see what happens. Yeah, I, I, I got so many ideas. I mean, you and I have already talked about this. That's why I brought you on because I'm so excited about this business. But I mean, all the ideas of, of bootstrapping and putting stuff out for, for dads to try, getting their feedback and positioning your company as the idea guys, because when you're idea guys, it's, it's implied that you're one of the inventors, dad. So, and I'm a dad and I, I, sent, I sent the clip back to the idea guys. I shot a video on my, on my phone and it's, it sucks because my gutter is shaped wrong. And then they came back and they said, oh, thanks, we're gonna fix it. And you get a free bag once we fix it. Oh, no way, I'm an inventor. My kids can be proud of me. You know, I, uh, I, I yeah. just love it. I well, just I, love it. It's, uh, I, I love the enthusiasm because it's really funny because I, I, get, I get one of two reactions, Mark, right? Because obviously, you know, I have a lot of connections in the software side. And so most of my software friends are like, you're doing what? Like that's uh, that, that's that's quite crazy though. Uh, but then once I sit down and I actually explain, I'm like, because uh, usually for those guys, I start with the like the very like what's wrong with the economics of this mm -hmm. of the software business today, and not that it doesn't work, but it's tough economics now. And they go, yeah, that's true. And then I walk through the okay, well, where's it? And it's kind of funny because like when I first started this, I'm like, well, I don't even know how to, I can't even effectively communicate. In software, I could I could actually you know code out a a mm -hmm. crappy version of it to show an engineer that they go, oh, that's a terrible version of it. But I, now I get your, I now I get your vision. But, you know, I took a bunch of online courses for learning how to do 3D design. And then, and so that I could communicate this stuff, not only uh, in pictures to real engineers, mm -hmm. uh, but also with physical, because I printed them, right? And I'm handing my engineer, here's, Here's my crappy version of it. And, and what I've actually been, this will not last by the way, that I've actually been pretty pleased with myself of how close the final really looks, looks to what my original concept was. Even the number of times they've circled back to some of the things that they've thrown away of my ideas, but where they they circled back and went, you know, actually I think you were onto something with the way that that was hinged or the way that that clasped together and, and so very uh, cool. So, so that won't last because they're they're they are way smarter than I am. And so I but I'm like, you have a, I'm like hey, this got of fun. Welcome to the new world, man. Every you're only two clicks away from an expert, and generally the experts work cheap because they're they've been commoditized, you know. So yeah. Listen, we gotta go. We're we're 10 minutes or 15 minutes over. Usually I I budget this, but this has just been so cool. I could go all day on this. I can't wait to come back with the um, with the gutter clips and and talk to the brand DIY guys about that. You got to come back before Christmas or whenever we get these things done. And uh, and the idea guys company is launched and I, I just really want to profile this. This is super cool. Awesome. Looking forward to it, Mark. And hey, thanks for having me on there. And also uh, great advice too. So really. No, it's, I love it. I love doing this. Okay. I'll talk to you later, Mike. Thanks, Mark. See ya. Bye. Bye.